Kenneth Alicio Bianchi. Yeah, Ken Bianchi, yeah. Bianchi. What's his story? Well, Ken, Kenneth Bianchi is he's the most interesting psychopath I've ever interviewed because he has he is so manipulative. He was one of the notorious hillside stranglers going back to the 70s. Who were they? Uh, Angela Bono, his half-cousin. Um, killed prostitutes and two little girls in LA, two school girls. But he tortured the, they tortured the victims. Um, they inserted needles into them and injected cleaning fluid into their veins. Um, they oh. put plastic bags over the head and put coal gas into them. Um, Ooh, they tortured these two little them. girls. Well, that was back then. Um, they did the most terrible things to these, tortured these women. They say the sexual killers. Again, they left the bodies like Joe did, Joe Dennehy did. They left them on the hillsides around Los Angeles, naked, with their legs open for everybody to see, like an insult. And the legs were always pointed towards the city itself. Um he, I firmly believe, when I was in Rochester, New York, uh, talking to uh, Captain of Detectives Lynn B. Johnson on another case, on Arthur Shawcross' case, um, that Bianchi was responsible for three homicides much, much earlier in his killing career, which were called the alphabet killings of three girls in Rochester, New York, three kiddies. Uh, they ca called them the alphabet murders or the double initial murders because the first name always began with the second second name. So you had Wanda Walkowitz, WW. After the killings of in the, the, the Los Angeles uh, series, about 12, I think, off the top of my head, maybe, maybe less, um, he fled to Bellingham, Washington with his common-law wife. Uh, she was already there. She'd left him, but he went there. And then he killed two co-eds, Karen Mandick and Diane Wilder, in one evening when they were doing some fake babysitting job for him, house-sitting job. Strangled them. Strangled them. I mean, I've seen the scenes of crime photographs. I've visited all the crime scenes. I've seen all the evidence. I've talked to all the cops. And I interviewed Ken. Uh, I, I worked with Kenneth for a long time in correspondence, and then I eventually interviewed him, as I mentioned earlier in the interview, in the Washington State Penitentiary. What did he tell you? <coughs> not a lot, excuse me, not a lot. But he did, he told me before I went there, because he he lives on a special housing unit. He's segregated from the main population. And um, he told me he had a big house. And he was like what you call a red band in the UK, like a trustee. So I asked, I had to run the prison for a week. I mean, I went on death row. I had all the inmates on death row unlocked and sitting around chatting to me. I had the run of the jail. And and I, I went up and I thought, oh, I want to go and see Ken in his big house that he's boasting about. And anybody who knows American prisons that you've got a, a row of cells, that, what they call a tier, and a yellow line, you mustn't cross the line, and then you've got the wall and the windows. And so I, the guards were a little bit edgy because they said, look, Chris, don't go over the yellow line because they'll spit or throw urine at you. Well, I walked up the yellow line and I came back and then I saw Ken's cell number eight. And I walked up to the bars and I said, because this is after he told me he'd kill me if I... And I, I, he was listening on this little bunk. You couldn't swing a cat around in this cell. And I, I said to him, Kenny, I said, is Christopher come to visit you in your big house, my friend? But he had headphones on. He was listening to a radio. And I shouted out, and he flew off of this bunk at the bars, screaming and shouting abuse. And the, the guards came up, and they said to him, Kenneth, you're being a naughty boy. We're going to throw you down the hole for a month, and we're taking your radio away because you've been a bad boy. And then I saw him again after that during an exercise thing. He did go out on exercise, and it was snowing. And I was standing feet away from him as he walked past, and he just looked down. He didn't look at me. You have to understand these killers, these killers will only attack and kill helpless women, prostitutes, elderly, children, babies. Very rarely face up to a guy. You described his eyes. How big was he? Uh, I suppose, I mean, I don't do 
metric, but I think he's about 15, 16 stone. Very stocky. Got to remember, these people spend a lot of time pumping iron. Um, but his eyes are, they don't blink. They're, they're coal black. And when you look, and when you look into those eyes, when I was looking into them, you can feel evil coming into you. They just stare, you know, and, and anybody has been stared at, like, you know, it can be unnerving, but, but it, I just walked around and. So how did he come to start killing people? What was his life like? He was an adopted child. His, his adoptive mother was Francis Piccioni. His father was, his adopted father, I mean, his, his original mother was a prostitute. Uh, she chucked him out as a baby. He was brought up with foster parents. The father was an alcoholic gambler. The mother was a needy mother. She wanted she wanted this adoptive boy like um, a, a little puppy, something that would run in. A, she could mirror her own insecurities in the boy. And he developed a multiple, well, a sort of almost a multiple personality as a result of that. But but he's a pathological liar. He, when he was arrested in uh, down in Los Angeles, he pretended he was a psychologist, and he stole lots of diplomas from real students, and he had a, a fake office. And his the idea was to lure girls into his web. He then became a doctor, Bianchi, and and then when he he was locked up. He became Reverend Bianchi, and then he got, believe it or not, he he got a law degree in prison. He's changed his name about four or five times, all shiny, instant names. I think he's been married three times since he's in prison because these half-wit women fall in love with these creeps. Well, Tex Watson, they had conjugal visits back then, and he had kids in prison, fathered kids. You're telling me something I don't know now. <laughs> I'm good for text. 